Hello and welcome to the Practical Leadership Podcast, where I interview great leaders and try to extract their wisdom and experience for you to learn from and hopefully avoid making their mistakes. Check out practical-leadership.academy because you want to help your new managers succeed with hybrid or remote working. Helen Marshall, thank you very much indeed for joining me. No problem. Happy to be here. Well, you got, you're got you my special guest today. So, Ellen, you are a powerhouse in the world of learning development. You wear lots of different hats. You wear them with a plum. Uh, Chief Learning Officer at Thrive, leader in the organisation, thought leader in the industry. You've got your own podcast, Diary of a CLO. Wherever did you get the name from? Ma, that was inspired. No idea. Champion for women. You founded Women In. Uh Fabulous podcaster, great relationship builder, and a conversationless par excellence, as we are about to find out. <laughs> I hope so. Anyway, yeah, thank you for that introduction, Paul. It's um, yeah, you're you're right. I do wear many hats, and um, I think I'm in quite a privileged position as CLO of Thrive to be able to 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 do projects that are, I suppose are passion projects for me, but that are having an impact on the wider community as well as the work that we do at Thrive. So yeah, in a very fortunate position, and um, I think particular as you just said diary of a clo has has been a bit of a new venture this year we're seeing huge success with that and the women in platform has been a, in a real um a breath of fresh air for me bringing women together uh, within the lnd space at the moment so lots of good stuff going on well fabulous we can get to the women in thing i want to dig into that a little bit it'd be quite interesting to to hear more about it but um this is this is my pod and i try to point people towards wisdom that we try and extract from wise people and wisdom. I think uh, I like to define it as the combination of knowledge plus experience plus reflection equals wisdom. So we try and pull that out of people's heads, specifically for folk who are earlier on in their management and their leadership career. So I think my first question definitely has to be, how, when did you first take on the reins of becoming a people leader? Yeah, it's an interesting one because I think I've, I feel like I've always had quite a natural affinity for leadership. So whether that was, um, I, I would even go as far back as primary school, definitely in secondary school, I was always kind of a leader within the groups I was, I was part of, whether that was um, socially in my friendship groups or whether that was in a, a sporting teams. So I was, sport was a huge part of my life growing up. And um, and I think, you know, it, it te- definitely teaches you a lot about uh, teamwork, particularly when you're doing team sports. So um, I think within shifting that into kind of a working environment I'd always set my sights on people management as part of what I did and and was it felt like quite a natural next step for me consistently within the businesses I was working towards so it was always kind of an aim of mine to manage a team and I think there's also potentially a certain um, emphasis that people put on the next step being a, a team lead or a, or a people manager or then senior leadership. And it, it's almost like a natural progression. But actually, I think that that is potentially shifting in, in today's working world. And um, it, it may be not necessarily what, um, you know, it's not as straight a line for people anymore. Um, but it was always the next step for me. It's always something I wanted to do. And I think I had a natural affinity for it because I'm I'm naturally empathetic and I'm trustworthy and I, I tend to build good relationships and I'm reliable. So I think those qualities are really important for leadership. Um, and so I, I, ended, I did I have ended up managing teams and I, I got a lot out of it personally uh, because I was helping people, p- particularly because I was helping people's um, professional development and able to, uh, was able to help them see where they wanted to get to and how they would get there. And I, and I did get a real joy out of doing that. I think now I'm in, in the role that I am in. Um, I'm not I'm not directly line managing people, but I'm sort of a dotted line for several people within the business. So um, I'm helping to again to guide them and, and talk about the the impact that they're having within a business. So I guess a slightly different trajectory, but um, it was always something that I felt quite passionate about and I knew that I wanted to do. And it did bring me joy when I was managing people as well. That's the gig, I think. You just nailed it right there. It brings you joy. It brings you joy. I think unless the the the, the definition, the the checklist definition is, I want to be a I want to be a manager next. I've got to be a manager now. Uh, why? 
because that's the next thing that's on my list. Mm, no good reason. No, unless it brings you joy, as you say. And I'm all about bringing joy. I'm, I'm, I'm digging into bringing joy. I'm digging into lacking regrets these days. So I'm, I'm thinking around these things quite a lot. If unless it brings you joy, just don't do it. If you can avoid it, you know. I don't, I don't mean I don't mean avoid all the hard stuff because they don't bring you joy. But joy is not quite as simple as being happy. It's more, something much more than that. As a, as a CLO, Chief Learning Officer, you obviously think a lot about learning, how people learn, what you can do individually, organizationally, psychologically, to help people develop themselves, both professionally and personally. What advice would you give or have you given to people who are early on in their career in terms of how they could develop themselves? Mm, I think it's it's understanding what your what your skills are and leaning into that I think so there's a there's often a tendency to focus on your weaknesses as a as an individual but actually if you reframe it to strengthening your strengths I think that always stands you in good stead and yeah and yes if there are obvious gaps that you need to work on then then do that that's fine but really lean into honing your skills in, in what you're really good at um, and that that is what becomes useful to to other people. And I think the the other side of that, in terms of people who are new to to management or um, or, or line management in general, um, is that you should trust until you have a reason not to as well. So we talk a lot about building trust with people, and it and it is really important to build relationships and and build rapport with people. Um, but actually. A lot of the time, we're, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense of hesitancy, I think, when you start managing people that you're not sure how people are going to perform. You don't really trust what they're going to do, potentially. But actually, you have no reason not to people. So if you can give people the benefit of the doubt and until you're proven otherwise, um, and hopefully you won't be, um, I think that's always a really good place to start as well. I think there's two bits there. One is um, there's a Ronald Reagan quote. He was talking about the, the various START treaties, the nuclear proliferation treaties between the US and the, and the USSR at the time. He says, trust yet verify. Now, yeah. Trust yet verify. That's it. I like that. Trust until you have a reason not. That's pretty good, actually. Then um, you see, you were saying strengthen your strengths, leaning into your skills there. Again, I, I really like to take advantage of you being the developer part extraordinaire, both somebody who's done it and thought about it deeply, because that's that reflection part of the wisdom triumvirate there. Um, what is there a particular how to lean into your skills? Is there a particular way of identifying, building on that? What, what would you say to somebody who says, okay, I think I'm pretty good at this. I'm not too toxic at these things. What do I do next, Helen? Well, I think being in the position where you have taken the time to self-reflect, and obviously reflection is very important, like you've just alluded to, and and being able to recognize what your own strengths are is is amazing. But actually, a lot of people do struggle with with understanding what their strengths are. So if you can uh, lean into mentors within your business or even outside of it, um, and whether that's in a friendship group or whether it is someone in a professional capacity to help you identify, you know, what am I actually really good at? Um, and and yes, it becomes a conversation then around, well, yeah, actually, I do think I'm really good at, at building trust, for example, or um, or um, dealing with confrontation, whatever that looks like. Um, but I think it, 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 there's a, that element of conversation to go with it, and, and whether that's mentorship or whether it's in a coaching situation, but, but relying on those around you to verify what you're thinking. So um, I, I think you, you can you're in an advantageous position if you're able to say, I think I'm really, really good at this. But it, it's also a little bit awkward for people to talk about what they're good at. And maybe even particularly from a female perspective to actually shout about what you're good at as well. Um, so if you can utilize those around you to to le really lean into that and think, this is what I think. Um, do you agree? What other strengths do you see? Everybody that, I mean, there's a thing in, um, in coaching around uh, what your blind spots are so things that you don't necessarily see uh, that your your strengths are and I think that's when that's when you know, bringing people from the outside in is really beneficial in those situations. My mum has a lovely saying where she says you can't um, I think it's my mum's maybe somebody else's she it's very difficult to see the label in the bottle when you're inside it yeah uh -huh. and absolutely the job of a good coach is somebody who's actually outside looking in I mean you in the environment might not might, might know exactly what to do but because you don't know it's a problem it's the unknown unknown you know it's the, the rumsfeld 
You have the known knowns, the unknown knowns, and the unknown unknowns. And yeah, you do. I, I was at an event yesterday, just yesterday evening, and it was a exec thing. There was maybe 10 or 15 of us, um, not quite 50-50 women, men, but it went round and it was an intro, you know, who does what, what you do, what you're on about, what's what's your challenge. And then the last thing was, to, in order to help this this collective environment was, and what should people come to you for? What are you really good at that people can come, for you, come to you for? And just as you said, most of the bloke said, uh, oh, well, I've got a lot of experience in sales, really. I've got a lot of experience in SDRs. I've got a lot of experience in partnerships, in international expansion, this, that, the other. And I think four out of the five women were, oh, well, I wouldn't call myself an expert. I'm thinking, I would. Uh, You're bloody brilliant. I give my teeth to have half of your experience, wisdom and reflection. And it was like, oh, oh but jeez. Yeah, I think I think it's something, I mean, historically, I mean, for me personally, growing up, it was always seen as um, a bad thing to share about how well you, you were doing form. at something. Do, 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 do. Yeah, and, it, and you, just, you just weren't encouraged to do it. Um, whereas, you know, and maybe, maybe men weren't actively encouraged to do it, but there was no kind of, uh, bad taste around them actually doing it when they did. And that's what was really hard. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's a really hard thought process to get yourself out of. Um, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of commitment to say, actually stand up and say, yeah, I am actually the expert in here. There's always the, the thing in the back of your mind is, and I think this is healthy to think, is that there's someone who is always going to know more than you. And, it, you know, you're never, you're hopefully never the one in the, in the room that is the, the ultimate expert in something. Um, I mean, I guess there will always be someone who is that person, but the, the, the assumption that you don't know everything um, it, it doesn't mean that you're not an expert in the fields that, that you're in and, and the recognition that there's always room to grow and always room to, to learn more and to, to do more is part of what makes you an expert, in my opinion. Mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's a tinge of imposter syndrome floating there, always, I think. Everybody's always vaguely concerned that, oh, dare I stand up and say, I I'm really good at this. And then somebody says, well, after my third Nobel Prize and the invention of electricity, I discovered that. Oh, God, okay. Um, and in this, actually, in, in this uh, Pride month, uh, Pride, of course, coming before the fall, and humility, I think, is a challenge that most, most people really, when you lean into the humility of from everyone, I can learn something. Mm. From everyone, I can learn something. For everyone, uh, I have something that I can take away. Every conversation, every person on earth is better at something than I am. Doesn't mean that I'm not an expert. Doesn't mean that I don't have greatness under my fingernails somewhere if I look really closely. But it's the humility to actually recognize that you can learn something from your, your taxi driver, from your postman, from everybody around you. Yeah. So learning. Um, what did you learn? What was it an event or a mistake from which you learned the most? Oh, so many. I imagine I could answer this. Let's so start in, alphabetically then. In a way, yeah, so I've got a long list. Um, you know what? Actually, the thing that always sticks out in my mind is a situation where I chose the wrong time and place to give feedback to somebody. Um, and that has that the one time where I, I did it wrong and didn't do it in the right situation and didn't approach it in the right way completely changed the way that I do it now and, and have done it since. So even though it was not a great experience at the time, it, it actually taught me so much about the way to handle situations like that in the future. So um, just to delve into that a little more deeply, I was part, I, I was running a, a, a team meeting and one of I'd asked one of my team to present on a certain topic and they were doing it and they weren't doing a great job. Um, and I provided feedback there and then in the meeting that you know it hadn't quite met expectation and why had they chosen to do this instead of that and um like looking like I just talking about it now I can't even believe I did it in that environment in front of everyone else in front of the other teammates and the, the reason I did it at the time was I and it's still important is giving feedback in the right uh, at the right time in a timely way sorry not at the right time in a, in a timely way is really important and I thought it's better for me to call this out now in front of everyone so that they realize you know that it's not quite right and and what they're saying isn't quite right and the team members don't take that message away because it's not the one that I want them to leave with but actually 
it actually really damaged the, the the environment in that meeting. Everyone felt very deflated afterwards. And obviously the person I gave feedback to was very upset. And, and what I should have done is wait until after the meeting and saying this out loud, it's, it all seems very common sense, but to take them to one side and to say, to say, you know, this didn't quite go to plan. Why do you think it didn't quite go to plan and be more of a coach in that situation to, to coach it out of them because they knew it wasn't quite right as well. Um, and so, you know, co context and, and timeliness with feedback is, is king, but you can be too soon with feedback as well, which I guess was the lesson there. Horribly challenging that, isn't it? If you're in the environment where somebody else is doing damage, or well, somebody in your responsibility is not, not maybe doing damage. Uh -huh. They're saying, you know, up is down and black is white. And you're thinking, no, it's not. It's really not. Can I just challenge this? Can we just perhaps reflect on uh, what is it you mean when you say that this is completely wrong? Yeah, that's the sort of the challenge to do. I mean, there's the feedback, um, your little feedback uh, trinity there. When you say, I observed that your figures were wrong or whatever it was. The impact is that the people around us now believe something that is true that is not true. And then the thing that I love just saying is, help me understand. And then you shut the hell up and let them talk. Help me understand. And then they can string themselves as high as you like with as much rope as you're going to give them. You know? But yeah, so I've, I've been with you. I've left this trail of destruction behind me. All these people that I've, I've experimented on unknowingly over the years of being a dreadful, dreadful, dreadful manager. I, I, I pulled this guy up in the middle of the open area and said, well, that was a rotten phone call. Why did you do that to that customer? And the guy was like, what? I mean, we were end up arguing. Team of fifteen people listening into this, and I was just—I thought I was doing the right thing, but surprisingly enough, no, it wasn't. Anyway, yeah, I, I think really he didn't if, last me long either. I think if you're if you're having the um, the insight to know that something hasn't quite gone the way you expected it to, um, I feel like even though it uh, as a result of a, a badly handled situation, if you have that insight to say actually that well, that doesn't feel right, I don't think I did a great job there. That actually makes you a really good manager to be able to 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 say hands up, I've not handle that in the right way. This is what I'm going to do about it. And and I think that's the difference. That some people don't even know that what they're doing is damaging to people, and they continue to do it. Totally, totally. See it with kids, actually. Mm -hmm. See it with kids. I mean, uh, I was I was talking about my talked to my nine year old fairly recently, and I was saying, you know that I've never been a dad before, right? And he went, what do you mean? Because he just thinks that's all I do. So I've never been a dad before, huh? Oh, well, you're the first time. You're okay, he's a bigger sister. But you're the first time I've done this. So I don't know what I'm doing. So see, when we did that and that and that, and I said this, I'm a bit sorry about that because, well, I have no clue what I'm doing. Really? Okay. And just as you said, it's it kind of it, it makes it more warm, open, acceptable, human. It's like, okay, we're actually in this together. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a... There's something about that. There's a better connection. Yeah, and say, uh, saying sorry um, to oh. children is a really powerful thing to do um, because they, you know, they then they are very empathetic back in that situation. You never hear. Um, it. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, they don't. They definitely don't hear it enough. Say sorry to Kenneth for beating him on the head with a brick. Sorry, Kenneth. Would you do it again? Totally would. I mean, no, I wouldn't do it again. You know, but if when I grow up, yeah, well, <laughs> when a grown up says it, I suppose it means more. Yeah. All right. Talk to me a little bit more about Women In. What's this all about? What are you working on? Yeah, so um, Women In is a, is a platform to connect women from, I, I would say all sectors, but we're primarily learning and development at the moment with a few HR professionals and a few freelancers and consultants thrown in there as well. Um, and it really arose from conversations that I was having with people, again, mainly from across the L&D space um, and particularly within small teams that, that weren't that were really feeling like they they didn't have any anyone to bounce ideas off to get out the echo chambers of the organisations that they were part of and and be part of a wider community and I and I had started to notice that I was hearing this more consistently from people and I thought this you know there's something that that needs to be done here so I kind of I, I had put off getting a group together because I. I have a tendency to want something to be perfect before I release it into the world. Um, so I'd been waiting and biding my time. And then I thought, actually, no, I'm just going to have to do something. So I set up a WhatsApp group um, and we've now got about, I think, 250 members um, of the group who just want to be part of this connection and community and, and really share in a safe space ideas or 
activities or challenges that they're having within their organizations um, or within the wider um, industry as well. So we set up the WhatsApp group, it, it, constant chats. Um, I mean, today we've been on the group, we've been sharing about um, icebreakers for meetings and like what everyone does. And that's just one example of a, of a chain of conversations that, that, will, that will probably happen over the rest of the day. Um, but we're also hosting, we have a platform that is that is powered by Thrive, but it's, a, it's an events platform. So we run monthly events through the platform that our members can act based on topics that are popular in the conversations that we're having on the WhatsApp group. So um, we've seen things like being human at work. Um, I think we've got coaching coming up. We've got, um, I think we've done one on fighting the imposter. Um, so things that, are, things, things that are quite pertinent to what we're experiencing and what some of the challenges are. Um, and those will, those will continue as, as the group kind of evolves but we've got plans to expand beyond LD. it's just obviously that's where my main network is so that's be what's happened we're seeing a lot of freelancers wanting that connection as well which makes sense people working in silo need that connection but we're also seeing a lot of ex-teachers who are wanting to actually transition from teaching into and into l d because of the challenges a lot of the time that are associated with education at the moment so um, yeah, really interesting group to be part of, really valuable people. And I know that like, the real uh, drive for me is that the people that are part of the community have made connections that have impacted the work that they're doing. So whether that's through just bringing fresh perspectives into what they're doing or through contracts that they're signing with, so people have actually got gained work through the group. So it's having a real kind of tangible impact on the people that are part of it, which is, you know, like, again, it's, it's something that brings me real joy. So I can't wait to see how it continues to evolve over the coming months and year. Well, excellent. Congratulations for doing something about something rather than just whinging. You know, actually you've gone out and done it. And the fact that people are getting work out of it, that's even better. That's brilliant. Yeah. There was a couple of scary statistics I came across, and it was in the, it was in the US that 43% of people have no best friend at all. No best friend. 13% mm. of people said that they have no friends. Teen no friends. So this whole, you talking about building community here, I think increasingly community, partnership, getting together. Yes, Zoom, AI, virtual, who gives a whatever, but actual human connection and underrated. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. It's just, just too powerful. Okay. What are you reading? What What is the knowledge that you are trying to gather? What are you listening to? What's your podcast library looking like? I have a, I have a long, a long list of well, actually, you know what? I've got a large stack of books by my bed that I just keep buying and then never finding the time to read. Um, I'm terrible. Sunduku. Sunduku. Do you know the word? Sunduku. No, I've not heard that. It's a Japanese word that defy, that is that is made for you and me, which is basically the pile of unread books. That's what Sunduku is. There's a word for that now. Oh, that's good. Jap Jap Japanese uh, culture tends to have a, w a word for all these things that, that we don't have in English language. It's It's lovely. Um, but yes, that, that is also me. Um, but, but what I would say is I, uh, I, I recently was sent, and I say recently, a few months ago, a digital copy of uh, Sekinda Pabial's uh, Resilience Handbook. And it's just been released in physical form and is available on Amazon. This isn't an advert. And um, so I bought it and I'm look, really looking forward to reading it again because it's such a valuable um, valuable read uh, for how you can approach resilience and think about resilience uh, mainly from for me mainly from a from a work perspective but also in your in your personal life as well so that's a, that is a book that I'm actively reading rereading again so I'm ignoring all the ones I haven't read and I'm rereading this one feels different when you've got it in your hands I think um but I, I guess like the, from a podcast perspective, as you mentioned, I, I, I have my own podcast as well, Diary of a CLO. And I, I put a post out on LinkedIn recently saying I've been so head head down in creating my own podcast that I've I'm I've not really been listening as actively as I wanted to to, to other things. But ones that I that I always do come back to are Learning Uncut, which is a podcast by Michelle Ockers, which I'm sure you've probably heard of, which is which is brilliant. And then, of course, the inspiration for Diary of a CLO, which is Diary of a CEO by Stephen Bartlett. Always extremely useful and emotive content on, on that podcast. Excellent. I like the idea of rereading the book that we've that have inspired us over time. You read something maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 odd years ago, whatever, and you go back to it and you say, oh, and there's always more you can get out of things. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, my, so my favourite book of all time is a book called East of Eden by John Steinbeck. And I always go back to it when I'm 
I don't, I don't, I don't know whether it's you know it's particularly stressful times or um, just every every couple of years I, I reread it and I always find something different in in the story and yeah it's I'd recommend anyone to read it. That's marvelous. I like John Steinbeck. Why not? Yeah, I mean, East of Paradise, isn't it? I think Eden is Hebrew for paradise or something like that, isn't it? Yeah. I, I don't. I wouldn't want to comment, but yes, mm. that wouldn't. It wouldn't surprise me because it's about um, the, the kind of the good and evil in the world, and kind of based on the, the story of Cain and Abel. So mm. it would make sense. Is there something you would like to thank young Helen for having done? This is a re- this is a really interesting question, um, and I think linking into what we spoke about previously about uh, being vocal about your success. I think I, I, I'm not go- I'm not going to say young Helen, but this was this was uh, young girl. Younger, yeah. So maybe six years ago, maybe. maybe. I'm going to say six years ago, but it might have been longer than that. Um, but working in my first fully remote role, so I'd never worked remotely before, and then this was pre-COVID as well. Um, and I suddenly found myself in an environment where nobody knew who I was, nobody really knew what work I was doing, except for the immediate team I was working with. Um, and it was really difficult to to build those connections and build those relationships with people. And I felt really uncomfortable, again, coming back to what we spoke about previously, actually saying, you know, look, everyone, I've, d- I've done this great piece of work and it's going to have an impact on X, Y, Z. And so I had to really push myself out of my comfort zone to say, here it is, like, this is what I'm doing, uh, you know, take a look, um, I'll chat to you about it, whatever that looked like. And um, I and I really genuinely think that taking the time to do that and for, to to then therefore build connections with people in the rest of the business and to build visibility as well has really helped shape what to, me to get to where I am today. So I don't think if I'd been been able to talk about the success I was having, I wouldn't be able to do all of the, the events and the public speaking and the, have the confidence now to, to to call myself an expert in learning um, uh if I hadn't done that and hadn't been part of that experience. How do you stay an expert? I think, I think it's com- coming back to what we spoke about earlier in terms of having that constant hunger and curiosity and awareness that you don't know everything and you never will know everything. And in fact, the more you know, the less you know, because you realise that <laughs> that idea connects to that idea and you don't, oh, we don't know about that. And, it, and you, you end up down a rabbit hole. And that, that is something that I struggled with when I was at um, I was I started a PhD, didn't finish one, but when I started a PhD, I... I really could not get my head around the fact that the more in depth I was getting with my research, the less I was knowing about everything that was going on. So although I was absorb absorbing an element of knowledge and and understanding, I was just there was just there were just too many rabbit holes to go down, and I, it was an, almost a sense of overwhelm at the amount of knowledge that is out there that you'll never have in yourself. So I think having that awareness is useful to um, to help you you know frame it. But being curious as well, curious enough to ask the right questions and keep asking questions. It's valuable. As we wrap up then, Helen, how can people find you should they want to knock on your door? Well, you won't be surprised to hear that I'm very active on LinkedIn. So I would say LinkedIn would be the first point of call. Um, but I also um, have a Twitter account, which I suppose is more more personal at days, really. I don't, I'm, I'm, LinkedIn is very much kind of thought leadership and industry related stuff. Um, but obviously Thrive have their own website as well, which um, I'd, I'd point people towards, which is thrivelearning.com. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn is, is the place to be for me. Helen Marshall, CLO of thrivelearning.com. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Thanks so much, Paul. It's been great to speak to you. That's a wrap. Thank you for joining me today. Your homework is to leave your five-star review and please, any comments you have, you really help me to improve every day. And it also helps people to discover me online. You should check out practical-leadership.academy because you want to help your new managers succeed with hybrid or remote working. 